I know mine's on. There's a light. Today in our call to worship, we, um, you might not have known this, we were quoting scripture. That was from the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28, in that call to worship. And the book of Joel is an interesting book in that we don't really know when it was written. It could be anywhere between 250 and 500 B.C. That's a gap. Like, that's a, you never, it, it could have been before Nehemiah. It could have been after Nehemiah. Nehemiah could have been aware of it. Nehemiah may have no, no idea. But in this passage, we see the same theme of God giving people a dream. So this is what it says. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughter will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. After what? Afterward. After what? If it was before Nehemiah, I'm sure Nehemiah thought after we rebuild the temple, this will happen. If it was after Nehemiah, it doesn't really work up in the sermon that way. It doesn't help. Instead, we as Christians have a different understanding. We believe, just leave it up. Just put it back up. Leave it up there the whole time. We're going to talk about this, this scripture a lot. We as Christians have a different understanding. We believe that this happened, that this will happen when the Messiah comes. When the Messiah comes and everything is put back the way it's supposed to be. And actually, if you, if you know your scripture, this did happen. You see, there's this, this, this holiday in the church called Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was sent down by Jesus into the world. And they're all in this room, and it, it shakes, and there's a, a blowing wind, and it says fire comes upon each of them. And they go out to the street, and they're preaching, and Peter goes out, it's okay, it's okay. And Peter quotes this passage. This is supposed to be what happens when the Spirit comes. God's Spirit will pour out. Children will prophesy. Adults will dream dream. Well, maybe Rick will dream dreams. Old men. Um, if you thought you were going to get past that without Wellington being here, I'm sorry. This is the kingdom of God. And that God's plan has worked, and all is right. That's what this signifies. And in the Old Testament, we have dreams and visions, but now this is for all people, not just the prophets and not just certain individuals. This is for all people. This is the secondary blessing. You see, the first blessing that's supposed to happen in, in Joel is that God's supposed to fix it all. God's supposed to fix what's broken. And so often we as Christians stop at the first blessing, right? I'm going to hell. I'm a sinner. Christ comes to save me. I'm no longer going to hell. It's fixed. And we stop at the first blessing. But there's a second blessing. This is the inauguration of how God's going to change how he deals with his people. And that's what we're reading today. God will pour out. What's interesting is, so often we think of this as, as a controlled pour. But the actual word here in the Hebrew doesn't mean that. It means spilled. It means that you sloshed it around a little bit. It's, it's messy. It's, I'll help you picture this. It's the difference between you pouring milk or your three-year-old pouring milk in their cereal bowl. <laughs> Is everybody tracking now what I'm talking about when I say pour? God will pour out generally, generously, His Spirit, the same Spirit through which all things were created, the same Spirit that brought Jesus back from the dead. That's the Spirit that God is not pinpointing people with. It's not a super soaker that he's popping each one of us. It's pouring out on all people. On all people. And what does it do? 
It causes us to prophesy, to dream dreams, and to have visions. And this is not a, this could happen. This is a, it's supposed to happen. My, my wife and uh, kids are down south visiting family, and I asked my wife was leaving, she said, hey, if you could put up the Christmas decorations while we're gone. That's not a, if it might happen. <laughs> That's a, it's supposed to happen. It's the same concept here. This sermon series we're calling Daring to Dream. And we believe that God has promised that he would give us dreams and visions for his kingdom in our world. That God will give you a vision, a, a stirring, a calling, whatever verbiage you want to use for his kingdom. And that God may have already done that. But if not, that God will do it. You see, Nehemiah heard of Jerusalem's plight. And he prayed, right? And God gave him a dream. But I'm willing to guess this. I imagine a lot of people had that same dream. I imagine a lot of people in Jerusalem were like, man, wouldn't it be nice? If our city wasn't destroyed, <laughs> it would just be swell if we had walls to protect our family. I imagine a lot of people had that vision. But Nehemiah had a dream, and he was obedient to it. And that obedience is terrifying. That obedience is is what sets Nehemiah apart. Obedience is what changes the life of Nehemiah and the entire people of Israel. Because I promise John or Joseph or some other name, I can't think of a non-biblical name that might be in the Bible. I don't know. What do you think, Doug? Doug might have had that dream. But Doug was like, yeah, maybe one day. It went about his life. Nehemiah had a dream, and he followed it. He was obedient to it. And now we have a book in our Bible called Nehemiah. Nehemiah dared to dream and he followed. And a lot of you, God has already given you that dream for the kingdom of God. Not for your kingdom, and that's important. I'm not talking about, you know, the, the TED talk of God's given you a vision for your, for your business and you're going to do this, you're going to do that. I'm not talking about that. That, that could be great that, that you praise God. God didn't really don't focus on that kind of stuff. God gives us dreams for the kingdom of God, not for the kingdom of us. But I believe that God has given us, or will give us, a dream. I think sometimes we hear that dream, or we sense it, and we get scared. There's no way that was meant for me. Clearly God meant to send that message to someone else, and I was just in the way. I intercepted that message. It could not be for me. Or we forget because we're just so busy. See, so many people think that a spiritual attack is when some awful thing happens in your life. The, the number one thing that the enemy does for us as God's people is to put good things in front of us because it blocks us from the best things. It blocks us from the God's things. It, it, well, I just don't have time. Well, I don't, doesn't God know my schedule? We got basketball practice tonight. I can't possibly. <laughs> so we get busy. We get fearful. Or we just forget. And as we do that, we're stuffing that dream lower and lower. And God is patient. He waits. God doesn't force himself on anyone. He waits. He, he floats it into our daydreams. He convicts us with that dream whenever we hear a sermon or hear a song that reminds us of God's glory. But he waits for us to respond. Daring to dream means we must be good stewards 
of our dreams. We have to have the obedience to receive a dream and then follow it. Recognizing that it's not on us, it's on God to complete it. The Spirit's going to equip us and give us the power. It's not on our own ability. Because if we're honest, our dreams that we make up on our own are pretty lackluster. But in Scripture, every time God gives a dream, it doesn't make sense. Nehemiah, build the temple. Joseph, take this woman who is pregnant as your wife. It's okay. <laughs> what? Every time God gives us a dream, it's not something we would dream normally. It's bigger. It's grander. And our obedience is the key. We have to be good stewards of the dreams that God gives us. Here's why. That dream could be for you. More often than not, that dream is for someone else. And your obedience could change people's lives. Nehemiah was obedient. Jerusalem was rebuilt. And God's people had a place to come home to. And maybe you, not being obedient to the dream that God has given you, is stopping other people from having a home to come back to. So during this sermon series, we're going to dream dreams. And here's a question I want you to ask yourself. What dream has God given me? Because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. God is going to give you a dream, you a vision, you a glimpse of what the kingdom could be. And can I tell you a secret? Oftentimes, the people who matter don't matter when it comes to dreaming. Brian and I could have a vision, a dream. That's usually not as big as it's supposed to be. But when you have a dream and a vision, that's what spurs the church forward. That's what brings the kingdom closer. Because leaders, we have these things we call egos that get in the way. Or the my jobs that get in the way. And that's why God's never once said, I will give pastors a dream. He will give it to all people because all people are the body of Christ. So that's my challenge to you. What's your dream that God's given you? What is the thing that God has placed on your heart to dare for, to be obedient to, to be a steward of, so that the kingdom of God would come on earth as it is in heaven? And if you don't know, let's pray about it. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for the power of your spirit. We thank you that you've made a promise to pour it out on us, God, to give us dreams and visions, to show us how we get to work with you in the bringing of your kingdom. So God, show us now through the power of your spirit what that dream is. Show us where we're supposed to go, what we're supposed to do, and bring us closer to you in the process. And give us the, the courage, God, to be obedient to it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.